Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the Melville Douglas Investment Update. My name is Mbombo Nogwina, and I will be your host this morning. Now, in terms of the current economic and investment environment, we have just come from a tumultuous 2020, and in 2021, the African markets have outperformed global markets. Against this backdrop, the Minister of Finance recently delivered a budget that was focused on containing spending while supporting households through tax relief. Now, in addition to that budget, the government had made announcements that it is in the process of reviewing Regulation 28 in order to make it easier for retirement funds to invest in infrastructure. And to that end, National Treasury has published draft amendments to Regulation 28 of the Pension Funds Act for public comment. Now, given this economic and investment background, today we ask the question, what does the current economic environment and investment environment mean for asset allocation decisions at Melville Douglas and whether fundamentals still matter? To answer these questions, we are joined by Paolo Senatore, Melville Douglas' strategist, as he unpacks the current South African environment and how Melville Douglas participates through asset allocation in our balanced portfolios. Now, before I hand over to Paolo, just a few housekeeping rules to guide everyone who's joined us this morning. Firstly, we'd like to encourage you to ask questions. Questions can be asked by going to the right-hand side of your screen and clicking on the Q&A box. You will then be able to type in your questions, and at the end of the presentation, I will assist Paolo in attending through as many of your questions as time will allow. Secondly, please note that all attendees, apart from the presenter, have been muted to prevent any disruptions. Thirdly, a recording of this webinar will be made available for your convenience. Please be patient as we do need to format um, the recording appropriately for your viewing before we're able to send it to you. Next, the, present the presentation will be eligible for CPD points. And at the end of the presentation, a QR code will be presented for you to scan and claim your CPD points. Lastly, if for any reason you experience a break in transmission or you experience a poor network connection, please close down the app and log in again using the same details. I will now hand over to Paolo for his opening remarks and presentation. Paolo, good morning and over to you. Good morning, everybody. Thank you for the introduction, Mvumbo. Um Welcome to the overview of the balance fund and please feel free to ask any questions as was indicated earlier. I think if we just uh, go to the agenda slide, we will just quickly just touch on the investment philosophy just to put it all into perspective. We'll then actually look at the fund and its structure and how it's positioned, a quick flash on the returns that have been achieved over the last while, and, and lastly, just the positioning, asset allocation, and the investment environment and how we see markets playing out from, from here. So if we start off, I think on the very first uh, topic, which is just the philosophy, just to touch base, we, we certainly are long-term invest, investors. So we're not chopping and changing in and out. We try to take uh, investments with runway behind them. And so when we look at something, whether it's a position in an asset allocation, or a, a position in a certain stock, for example, we do look for years as opposed to two months. Uh, and that, that typically is the approach we take. We, we have balanced portfolios. Obviously, the balance fund is balanced by its very nature across asset classes. But even within the asset classes, we would find ourselves taking a position with regards to diversification within equities and so forth. And, and, and the other point is about quality. Uh, what we categorize ourselves as is a quality investor. You would, hear, you would have heard other investors being value investors, for example. <clears throat> we certainly are in the quality camp and we look for counters that have a quality of balance sheet, a quality of cash flow, earning streams and dividend streams as an example. And that is this, the second last point is that earnings over time does grow, capital growth. Uh, what one, it obviously makes sense that uh, if there's a growing I revenue stream or income stream and distribution stream, that it would lead to a appreciation in the asset price. And then just lastly, we are investors of high conviction. So our portfolios in our asset classes are not littered with um, 
hundreds of stocks. Typically on the equity side, it'll be 25 to 30 counters. Even within the bond exposure, we, we're not overpopulating the various asset classes. So really a bottom-up investment house looking for quality, fairly concentrated portfolios. And overarching to all of that is a philosophy that we're long-term investors and not short-term traders. Okay. The balanced fund sits within the multi-asset category. So it is a, a medium risk. Obviously on the right-hand side would be the high-risk funds of Melville Douglas, which would be the equity funds. And on the left-hand side would be the income funds, which would be of a lower risk. So needless to say, it's got the various asset classes from equities, bonds, offshore, offshore cash, offshore or offshore fixed income, offshore equities, as well as property, giving us an ability to to tailor make our allocations to these asset classes and deliver what we deem to be a median risk uh, profile for the investor. So that's really just uh, an introduction of where the fund sits from a risk profile and from an investment philosophy. And then really we can now start to go into the presentation having had that backdrop. So the balance fund, it's got a 17 year track record. It's uh, 350 odd million rands worth of AUM. It is a CIS liquidity. It's traded daily. Settlement is T plus five. So it's fairly liquid from that perspective. It's managed in compliance with regulation 28 and it is a RAND fund. So typical of a balance fund uh, in the South African context and comparable to other CISs in, in that space. Okay. If we look at the investment returns, it's quite interesting and we will raise some of the risks here. And if you look at uh, around March, April last year, you would see markets pulling back the red line, the all share index quite aggressively. And that's obviously the onset of COVID and a, an understanding that this would have impact on global, on global growth, South African growth. You can see the MSCI All World Country Index coming off as well. <coughs> So a severe correction in markets, but then quite a strong rebound. And you can see that rebound from March, April onwards. And that's in anticipation of a economic recovery due to immense stimulus that the globe had put into the economy. And we'll see in our presentation that interest rates around the globe are at all time lows. So it's quite unclear at that time what type of recovery we would have. Would it be a W-shaped, an L-shaped, a U-shaped, V-shaped? So a lot of letters come out of that. But now, as we stand at this point in time, it appears to be that it's more like a V-shaped type recovery. And to give you an indication, China most likely grow at about 8% this year, America, USA around 6%, and South Africa around 4%. And just to put the South African position in context, last year we would have lost growth to the tune of around 8% or so, 7, 8%. So our rebound of four, not as strong as China and the USA, but quite rapid um, expectations of economic recovery. So needless to say, we had a pandemic, a very sharp downturn, but actually quite a strong gradual uptick in, in market. And when you see the equity returns that I'll show you just now, just bear in mind the base of those returns is around obviously this time last year, so March, April, where the markets were dipping. So equity market returns have been exceptionally strong over the last year and have been a big contributor to the balanced fund performance. In fact, those are the categories, both offshore and local equity returns that have performed. The risks one has to watch. There's a short term risk a medium term and a longer term risk. The short term risk is COVID. We still don't know how it pans out, um, do the vaccines and how they roll out, or what time it'll take exactly. There seems to be delays on that front and what variants can come out. So we do talk of the third wave and in some countries a fourth wave. And so it is a little uncertain how that can impact the various uh, growth projectiles. And so one just needs to bear in mind COVID hasn't gone away and how it will remain and stay and which industries it will affect and for how long is still quite complicated. The medium term risk is with this growth, the US growing at 6% and China growing at 8 and South Africa at 4 is what impact will it have on inflation? 
Now, it doesn't appear to us that it's got a large impact on inflation. But if it does, it means interest rates will be lifted. And that, of course, has an impact on the valuation levels of equities. And therein lies the medium term risk for equity. So it doesn't appear inflation is a problem during the course of this year. But of course, markets discount a year or so ahead. And during the course of next year, inflation may well, with that type of growth rate coming through, present uh, a hurdle for, for investment markets. And in the longer term risk is the debt levels to which the globe has gotten itself into. So whether it's South Africa or the USA, a lot of stimulus has been put into the economies to get it going, to fight the pandemic essentially, and debt levels to GDP have lifted to all times high, really literally around the globe. And some way you have to address that. You may address it through devaluing your debt, and that might be quite simple by having a situation where your inflation is above your 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 long bond yields and you can issue debt below inflation and it devalues over time. That's the luxury the USA has, where its 10-year paper is trading at about one and a half, but its inflation is at around two. Alternatively, you're in the South African scenario, which is vastly different. You have inflation of about three and a half. You have long bond yields at nine. That's where you issue paper at, at over 9% yields. It's expensive debt. And so you have to consider austerity measures because you can't devalue the debt. And of course, that means cutting back on government expenditure, which is quite a difficult proposition. So those are the challenges. We've got ourselves in a lot of debt. Debt ultimately doesn't come for free. It's fine to issue debt while inflation is very low. But if it were to raise its head, it does present a fundamental problem going forward. If we go, so that's just an overview of the markets and where we stand at the moment. If we look at the performance of the Melville Douglas Balance Fund, you'll see in the last year it's done 14.8 or essentially 15% return, which is an acceptable return given where inflation is, of course, inflation running at about three and a half in cash. You can see the line below giving 4%. So really, you know, three times and more than the, than the cash alternative as your risk-free kind of option. And importantly, over, over the bond market as well. So the bond market giving 8%, just over 8% was essentially its coupon basically. Uh, so the interest that's paid on the bond that, that primarily makes that return. And then you can see the very strong returns of equity. The cap swicks all share 24%. And international MSCI, all country in RANDs, having a strong return as well in, in 25%. And one might just make the view on the RAND has been fairly strong at around 15. Of course, it comes from a level of 19. So the RAND has strengthened and it basically figures out on what I was mentioning earlier. This going back to global growth is good for emerging markets. Remember when there's a crisis into safety, into US dollars, into the States? When it's going back into global growth, funds flow out into emerging markets, which can pick up on the growth story. And of course, the RAND is a proxy for emerging markets. And as we've seen equity markets rally, emerging markets have been strong, and the RAND has rallied on the back of that. Not only that, it's also rallied uh, because the interest rates in South Africa are relatively attractive as well. So it's a growth phenomena and an interest rate phenomena. And that's what's been supportive of the RAND. So Mumva mentioned just a little bit earlier that if you look at the shorter term and you will look at the year to date, you can see the cap swicks at 8.6%, the international MSCI or country world index at 5%. So the South African market now doing better than the, the global environment. And part of that, of course, is the strong RAND. Okay, we'll go on to the next slide now. That will be our asset allocation. So you can see during the course of time, previous 12 months and the current holdings, our South African equities have been held at around 51%. So no real changes there. Where you will see a change is in the international equities having moved from 18 to 25%. So we did bolster that position in anticipation of a improved uh, economic environment. And on what we think a longer term will also be a, a weakening rand longer term because of our debt proposition and growth proposition in South Africa. So just to mention on the growth proposition of South Africa that uh, although I mentioned we grow by about 4% during the course of this year, one must remember it's a bounce off a very low base. 
What happens in 2022 and 2023 when that base is ironed out is that typically our growth rates will soften to potentially below two, maybe one and a half. And that's the growth scenario for South Africa. Obviously, it's we've got uh, various dynamics that uh, hinder growth. And of course, some of those just might be the electricity supply that can't support the grow higher growth rates. So we set at growth rates, which is fairly mundane, and we, we, we set at uh, a country level of debt, which is subs- much higher than potentially we can carry on with and needs to be addressed. And that, in principle, could lead to rand weakness longer term. But in the shorter term, there is the, 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 the world economic growth trade, of which emerging markets benefit and the RAND benefits as well. So short-term strength, longer-term weakness. Then the domestic bond fund sitting at 16%. Our expectation there is that we should largely get the coupon out again, which is roughly 9%. So our expectations are that we can still get a 9% return out of the bond market. We're fairly comfortable there. International bond fund is where we're a little cautious. Uh, yields in the USA, if you go back some time, were around 1%, they're now over 1.5%. So rates have been rising, and that's an anticipation of growth and potentially higher inflation levels. As rates go up, there's a negative consequence on the capital value. So uh, potentially we will remain fairly low on international fixed income stock. The point to note, though, is if you take our international equity at 25% and our international bonds, that adds up to 20, 29% or so, which is essentially our full allocation to Reg 28 that we can take assets offshore. So we, we have a full position to offshore assets. And then on the domestic market, you can see money market is low down to 2%. So we are essentially utilized cash, which was the worst performing asset class and allocated it um, is primarily to international equity during the course of the time. And then there's a small holding in domestic real estate. Okay, so that's the structure of the portfolio. If we just look at <clears throat> some of the Reg 28 issues, I think Reg 28 is there for an important reason. One is to avoid concentration risk or fund managers from, bear in mind it is People's Pensions Fund, from going into excessive concentration risk and to ensure diversification. So infrastructure, one must bear in mind, we're in a low growth environment, government's inability to fund it as well. Government has already stretched its debt levels, as we'll see later, and and it's an important engine or driver for future economic growth. So the pension fund asset base is attractive from that perspective to to fund such um, activities. There is limits, for example. Um, it is unlikely to exceed a level of 45% across all assets. And remember, all assets could be your debt funding through the bond issuance or your equity funding or your private equity funding. So there's various avenues through which one could get uh, infrastructure type exposure. And then an additional 10% to the rest of Africa. So it's primarily South African focused. And there are some changes, for example, private equity is obviously a a useful vehicle to gain exposure to these type of activities. There's a a limit on Reg 28 to private equity and hedge funds of 15% collectively, 10% in each as a limit. And it's proposed that the the limit to private equity be raised to 15% from 10%. And these are drafts and they're up for discussion, of course, but it's one way to try and facilitate an investment in infrastructure, which from a Reg 28 perspective might be, and from a balanced fund management perspective, might be uh, quite attractive. Obviously, the fund is governed by the rules that come out, and we will have to abide by those rules. And then no doubt um, there will be many projects that come out or, or solutions or fund structures that come out that are focused towards infrastructure and the balance fund would look at that, potentially add something into that, into the fund if they, if we find it attractive, of course. So no doubt, as I say, there will be many products that are created for the pension fund industry to invest in, in this, uh, in this space. Okay. So this is now just digging into a little bit into our, um, 
portfolio. If you look at our bond market, um, we have yields of over 9%. It's uh, probably worth mentioning that the 10-year bond is yielding 9.4. Inflation sits at about 3.5. There's a real yield there, which is exceptionally attractive. And we have just gone long duration on our bond fund. So we are about 105 or 105, the duration of the all bond index. And that is why you can see we are overweight the 12 year space and underweight everything else on the yield curve. And that's just for us to capture the yield. As I said, the 10 year is sitting at 9.4 and to increase our duration in the bond market. So that's how we currently positioned simply because we don't think inflation is going to be much of a concern for this year. And it's unlike interest rates in the short term, we have a very steep yield curve, of course. Six month paper yields about 4%, 10 year paper 9.4, so over twice the amount. And potentially towards year end or during the course of next year, there may well be a cycle where rates are rising. But in the short term, and during the course of this year, we do not see inflation as a, a typical concern. To, to get a coupon of 9.4%, we think is relatively attractive. And so we're taking full advantage of that and, and just recently gone overweight the all bond duration, uh, from, from, from that perspective. Okay. When we look at what we invest in, it's fairly conservative. Uh, you'll see it's really all government bonds. We don't have any ESCOM paper. We don't have any transnet paper. Obviously, there's a bit of cash in the portfolio just from a functionality point of view. It is essentially a portfolio buildup of government bonds. So as risk free as we, we, we can take it. And then there is some other credit in the portfolio, but that's the big four banks essentially. So that would be first rand standard bank paper that we have on the shorter durate, shorter duration maturities. But just to give a sense of comfort that, um, from a risk perspective, it's as conservative as we potentially could have built out this portfolio, but long, long duration. Okay, if we move on then to the next slide, we'll start um, getting into equities. This is our, our allocation to equities. You'll see basic materials, we're at 25. That comprises our three stocks of Anglos, Billiton and Mondi, slightly underweight basic materials. It's quite difficult to get a, a weight of around 30% to one sector. It is um, obviously a big sector in the South African context. When one looks at it globally, it's nowhere near that type of weighting. And it's important to mention that globally, the opportunity set is much wider than in South Africa. Other than that, you'll see by and large, fairly similar weightings to the sectors, except when you look at technology, and that would be NASPAS process, where we have a slight overweight position. And the financial services, which is, you know, banks and insurance companies, there's a small overweight position there. So the, in terms of performance, where performance came from last year, uh, resources were a big provider of performance and specifically the precious metals, platinum. And of course, NASPAS was a big performer. So like the offshore markets, the indices kind of gave a skewed picture because Internationally, it was very much IT stocks listed in the USA. So the USA market did well, and it was those IT high technology stocks like Amazon, Google, Facebook that did those stay at home COVID beneficiaries that did well. And because they are so weighted in the index, the index looked like it did very well. The market was not that broadly spread out. In the South African context, if you take basic resource materials and you take technology, it brings you to over 40% of the index, and those two did exceptionally well. To give you an idea, Anglo-American did 155% over the last year. Amplats did 277%. So, I mean, that's the strength of those kind of runs in the last year. And then NASPAS did 62%. So an exceptionally strong set of numbers coming out leading to an index return of around 70% for the last year. But just note, if you take a South African stock, a South African proxy, then that would be something, an industrial company like Bidvest, for example, which is very much a South, a South African industrial trade. That was only up by 7%. So you can see how skewed the markets are between those type of companies that benefit from the stay-at-home technology like NASPAS through Tencent, 
or through a recovery in economics. Uh, e economies around the globe like China growing at 8%, the demand for commodities, and you get, you know, exceptionally strong iron ore, copper prices, for example, uh, running, platinum prices running into the basic materials. But that's the position of the, of the portfolio. Not too, not too different from the cap switch. Okay, the next slide. It's just the top 10. So you can see, as I mentioned, our materials was uh, Anglo-American, Billiton and Mondi. You'll see those all in the top 10. Anglo is the biggest stock. Um, not quite, and I'll explain why, but the, the biggest stock and the third biggest stock all being resource counters. And, and part of it is that they've grown into those positions, but also quite comfortable to hold counters where we know the, the, the support for the commodity price, but that the cash flows into these companies are so strong at the moment. And of course, they're able to wind down the debt on their balance sheets exceptionally quickly, which leads to either an upping in the dividend, so a higher dividend yield, a special dividend potentially, or share buyback, or even potentially acquisitions. But these resource counters like Anglo and Billiton have exceptionally strong cash flows at the moment. And uh, that's the reason why we hold them in the portfolio at the moment. Mondi, if, although in resource is not a typical resource company, it's obviously a packaging, paper packaging, but more of a packaging company. And we hold it as well to benefit from the trends in online. Everything goes in a cardboard box. Obviously, they make the cardboard box, so there's a beneficiary there. The biggest share in the portfolio is really Nuspass because you must own Process, and Process uh, is owner of Tencent, as is Nuspass. And if you, uh, if you add the... 10.3 of Nuspass in the process, you get to around 15% in the, in that, in that counter. So that really would be the, the largest position. And then once we go through those resources and the Nuspass and process, which are the two big performers for the year, we were able to at least say we captured a large part of that in our top 10. Then you start to get to the Standard Banks of First Rands, which we think will do well as a South African economy, because they are proxies for the South African economy. So as the South African economy recovers, they should do relatively well. And we expect um, a fairly decent set of returns and earnings rebound for those type of South African-based uh, economies. So you'll see the Standard Banks and First Rands, the banking stocks, as South African proxies being quite well placed in the top 10 as well. If we go to the next slide. This is just where we overweight. So we obviously overweight now, uh, although underweight the sector because we, there's obviously many counters. It invariably makes us overweight the counters we hold, which is Anglos, Billiton and Mondi, just an ex as an example. Uh, and that's really all I wanted to show on that, uh, on, on that slide. The rest of the, of the shares where we might be overweight, like a quilter or a coronation is because they're quite small in the index. Eh? And then underweight positions. We would be underweight to a sector that has grown quite large, and those would be the direct commodity plays. And so you'll see Impala Platinum, you'll, you'll see Anglo-American Platinum, Anglo Gold, for example, all sitting in positions where we don't have these highly cyclical stocks, which in their own right bring quite a lot of risk. So we have got the Platinum exposure. We've taken it through Anglo-American. Anglo-American when you get to earnings, about a third of the earnings comes from platinum. So we've taken the exposure indirectly and not through the typical stocks, which uh, can be quite volatile. And uh, some of them may even be fairly marginal, depending on where the price of gold or platinum plays. So platinum has remained fairly strong. But if you look closely to these precious metals, you'll see that gold typically hasn't performed so well of late. And then where we haven't been, which has been quite important over the longer term, has been a company like Sassel, which has experienced many difficulties, but more recently seems to be getting its balance sheet into a position where we might want to look at it, and certainly having corrected some of the dilemmas they've had in the past. And then if you look through the, the underweight, you'll see a company like ShopRite, for example, but we have we have exposure to that sector through companies like Pick and Pay and Spa. So it's not that we are underweight that specific um, shopping retail, retailer, for example. If we move to the next slide, 
And this is just international, the equity holdings there. And the only point really to show is it's fairly well diversified. If you look at the sector, you'll see there's everything from information technology to communication. Communication is essentially IT as well, but there's financials, there's healthcare, there's industrials, there's consumer discretionary. So everything from a Starbucks to a Microsoft corporation. And obviously under this type of environment where people work from home, where it's teams and where it's online shopping and things like that, uh, where it's Google, you know, we've had the holdings, for example, Microsoft, Tencent, and we've had Alphabet as well. Uh, Alphabet is, is just another name for Google. So we've had exposure to those sectors that have done exceptionally well, but so have, um, you know, sectors like healthcare, for example, and we'll touch on some of that. They've been fairly good performers during the course of the year. If we move to the next slide, this is just the exposure, the offshore geographic exposure. You can see if you look at the region, uh, it's primarily in the USA. Obviously, that is the biggest market in the globe. And so typically your portfolios have the largest exposure to, to the USA. It has been the better performing market of the developed world, uh, but you'll see it's not without exposure to example, the emerging markets where you see 12% exposure. So the fund or the portfolio does take exposure, although it's offshore to more than the developed markets, it does have an exposure to the emerging market. And then the sectors you can see on the left hand side, Information technology, one of the larger sectors, but the diversification, which is an important perspective when building a portfolio through the various sectors. Okay, the next slide. We just go to the equity. Um, I think the only point I want to relay here, if you look in the middle of the page, you'll see dynamic view, risks exist, but valuations are attractive. So this is the difference between the South African market and the offshore market. The offshore market, if you take the MSCI, trades at quite a high multiple at the moment of around 20. South Africa, if you strip out Nuspas, trades at about 13 or 14. So the valuation level is quite attractive and we've got a strong rebound in earnings of around 30%. So a combination of an attractive valuation level, not demanding, and a strong bounce in earnings makes for a potential reasonable outcome in in capital appreciation of that index offshore it's had a good run to some degree some of the value counters where they were on the back of economic recovery earnings may bounce they may find that they have time for re-rating and we have seen value fund managers doing relatively well of late but when you take the index which is populated by these high it stocks as i mentioned earlier uh, sitting at a fairly demanding valuation levels because they've run so strong it now is a time really on the back of their own economic growth rate in those countries for earnings to catch up with the, with the valuation level. So we expect lower absolute returns out of the international markets than we do out of the South African market. So offshore flattish type returns on the equity space and in South Africa, uh, we'll touch on it later on a stronger set of uh, returns from the South African equity market. And then just on the longer term, which is the bottom bottom line, low growth environment with low inflation, negative for equities. The, the real difficulties, I said, we will bounce back a 4% growth rate. It'll, it'll, we'll achieve a 30% earnings growth on our model portfolio. But what about the year after that? And that's when the growth settles back to around the one and a half, two percent level and earnings will come off. Not, not necessarily in absolute terms, but the earnings growth rate will, will start to come off. And that has some impact for longer term capital returns on, on equities. Okay, then if we move on, this is just, I'm going to be very quick on these. These are just the returns year to date. You can see Nuspas having still performed. Uh, Nuspas is quite interesting. This is obviously Nuspas in process, but Nuspas trading at a 40, 50% discount to 10 cent or to its, its uh, sum of the parts, which is a huge uh, discount. Obviously a consequence of uh, investment holding companies, but also a consequence that um, South African investors can't really hold more of what they have and offshore investors don't really need to buy Nuspas because they can now buy process directly or theoretically they could just buy 10 cent in any event. So some discount there, but nonetheless, still a very strong sector. And interesting to note that real estate still lag and we expect that to be a difficult sector 
in a South African context. We don't own any South African property companies, but certainly we have seen a change in the working environment. We all work from home, so office requirements are difficult. And in the shopping center, the retail space, we have found that tenants have found pricing power. So there's definitely a reversion down in terms of when leases come due for lower rental levels, and that puts some pressure on the market. Interesting enough though, you can see that basic materials um, still performing reasonably well, but with healthcare, given the pandemic and you know the return to potential manufacturing of companies like Aspen, or, or once the pandemic is out the way, that the return of elective surgeries back to the hospital groups are able to lift their occupancy levels, we have seen a decent return out of the healthcare sector as well. If we look at the next page, it's on a longer term, it's on the one year basis. You'll see how bad real at that time period. So it's been a sector one didn't want to be exposed to. And as I said, we have no exposure to South African property. But you can see what I was talking of earlier. When you look at industrials, healthcare, financials, all negative. The only side that's really doing well, uh, and it might, <clears throat> it might be worth mentioning that consumer goods looks like it's doing quite well, but that's because Richmond was inside there and it benefits off the Chinese growth cycle with luxury goods. Is technology once again, which is NASPAS and the mining side. Platinum, very strong, gold, strong, as I said, uh, and the basic materials strong. So although our index looked good, it was driven by technology, NASPAS, and driven by resources. The rest of the market wasn't strong at all. So it wasn't a broad-based rally. It was very focused towards two sectors. But of course, these, let's call them difficult sectors of last year may very well be the more prominent sectors because they show value in in the in light of an economic recovery and that's where we may get up a better returns going forward okay next slide we will just expected return so in the portfolio we think we'll get a dividend yield of around three percent or so as dividends return, you know, you're aware that the banks cut dividends, for example. We expect them, when I mean, they have started, Standard Bank has started, First Rand has started, to repay their dividends, probably take another year or year and a half before they get to 99 levels. And you can see the very strong rebound in earnings per share that we're expecting. But that results in a, re, a derating of the valuation level of the stock. Nonetheless, the expected return is what's important, is around 12% is what we expect of uh, the the current levels and just bear in mind the all share has already rallied 10 percent year to date so for the full year we would be looking then at a return of 20 percent potentially higher so we're still quite optimistic south african equities and will maintain our position in that space the next slide just shows where those earnings are coming from so if you look on the left hand side, that's the earnings growth of the portfolio, 34.6%. And where it comes from, you'll still see those, I said earlier, basic materials, strong economic growth, strong commodity prices, exceptionally strong cash flows, basic materials pushing through earnings growth of 41%, winding down their debt, paying the special dividends, share buybacks, whichever they choose, or further acquisitions, or, or retaining the capital for expansion. Uh, but that's the dynamics playing out there. And then you can still see, um, you know, strong returns out of technology financials, really across the board, acceptable type of earnings growth coming through with a very strong outlier being property. And that's Nepi Rock Castle, which is Eastern European shopping center, but it's just off a very low base. So one's just got to bear, bear that in mind when you see 80, 80%. You know, it's like uh, when you have 100, 100 rand earnings and you go to 10 and then you from 10, you go to 20, you know, you've had 100 percent earnings growth so it's that type of base effect that's coming through there that's all and then when you look at the portfolio the PE of around 15 percent technology obviously is quite high and that's um, that's NASPAS but if you look at the portfolio PE of 15 it's not demanding from a historical perspective and if you strip out NASPAS it would be lower than that goes down to the 14 13 and a half would be relatively attractive from a valuation perspective given that you're going to have an overlay of around 35% earnings growth, uh, there's still in our minds a fairly attractive proposition in the equity market position. Okay, 
So if we go into the investment environment quickly, as I did say, the first risk we face is COVID and we don't know how it plays out. We talk of the third wave, but internationally, USA has still got high numbers behind it. We don't quite know how this return to normal actually plays out and what time frame it takes. And so when will people actually go back to the office and, and things like that? Uh, when will they go back to travel and hotels and so forth? So that's still an uncertainty and it's not quite clear how that impacts growth in the very near term. When I say the near term over the next year, year and a half or so, but it's still something we've got to keep our eye out. I know there's vaccines, but you've still got to keep your eye out for it to understand um, how it plays out. Okay, then you can see in South Africa the repo rate down to 3.5% as low as it's ever been. And this is not a South African phenomenon. It's US, it's Europe, it's around the globe. Everyone cut interest rates. It was part of the stimulus program. We don't expect rates really to rise during the course of this year because inflation, which we'll look at now, is not expected to, to pose a problem. But fundamentally, these type of levels, uh, once growth comes back and inflation rears its head again, won't remain at these type of levels. But it's just to show that from a repo rate perspective, we've been as low low as we have been. And so they've done what they can, obviously raise debt on the balance sheet, but also cut interest rates to support the economy. This is CPI. You can see it's trading at around three and a half, and uh, it's not expected, as I, as I suggest, during the course of this year to be a problem. It's not expected to be a, cause, a problem in the US either during the course of this year. But the point being, it, it under the position of growth, and, and when you get to the USA, where you get uh, lower employment, unemployment levels, you do start to get inflation creeping in. And then, of course, it's a risk. As soon as the US starts to hike, right, hike rates, there's some some form of pressure on South Africa to to hike as well. And and you've seen that on the long bond in the US raising from about one percent to one and a half. And you saw our our long bond, the ten-year paper rising from below 9 to around 9.4% 9, 9 as well. So these markets are intercorrelated. But in during the course of this year, I do stress that inflation is unlikely to be a problem and there shouldn't be a pressure on us to lift short-term or repo rate. And so the yield curve is expected to remain steep. And by that, I mean short-term rates, you know, around 4% or so, long-term rates over 9%. <clears throat> And if inflation is contained, then a long a rate of over 9% is relatively attractive. And so that's what we say in this chart that we have on the screen now. You can see that spike, and that was when we were downgraded. It's likely that we could be downgraded more because our debt levels are ever increasing. But nonetheless, at this kind of level, if you take out the spike, you can see it structurally sits at this 9% level for some time, which we would deem to be relatively attractive. And so just interesting to see when they did downgrade us, the yields went over 12%, but they recovered pretty quickly after that. So the downgrade didn't have too much of a material effect uh, on the bond on the bond yields there. Okay, then uh, this is just the RAND. And as I mentioned, the RAND sits at around 15. Because of this return to growth and the benefit to emerging markets, the RAND is an emerging market play. We do have a trade surplus, which helps as well. And those overlook the longer term impacts of high debt levels and structurally lower growth rates. And so in the short term, we can see this RAND strengthen below 15, 14 and a half, where it may go, for example. But on a longer term, longer term basis, given our structurally lower growth rates, our high debt levels that we need to contain, we would expect the RAND to structurally weaken with higher inflation levels as well relative to the developed world over time. Okay, then this is just the trade balance, as I mentioned, which has gone positive. Once we go back to growth, we'll start importing again, and this may change the picture where you have the double deficits. You have a trade deficit and a budget deficit, which is typically negative for the RAND. But at this point in time, just to highlight that this is one of the factors that support the RAND. So we are exporting more than we're importing, and that's because demand is weak, and also helps that the commodity side is quite strong globally and helps our exports. So this obviously you're, you're making dollars out of this trade at the moment, and that's RAND supported. So one just needs to keep an eye 
on the trade balance if one wants to take some kind of perspective on, on where the RAND might be going. <clears throat> okay, and then just on South African inventory to GDP, uh, you can see how business South Africa or industry South Africa has pushed down inventory to all-time low levels. But as the economy recovers, there'll have to be the inventory rebuild, which will be supportive of growth as well. It does imply, obviously, that uh, South African corporates have reacted. They've done something to, to account for the weakness in the economies, and, and they've cut back and become more efficient. But as we suggest that high demand uh, coming through during the course of the year will require high investment in stock. And, and of course, potentially infrastructure of, of uh, corporates, you know, new machinery, things like that, for example, which will all be supportive of that economic growth cycle. And then if we look at um, global markets. This is just uh, when I mentioned earlier that South Africa has an attractive valuation level and a strong earnings rebound. If you look at it internationally, it is skewed, MSCI All Country World Index. It does get skewed obviously to the USA and to IT stocks like Amazon and Google because they're weighted heavily in the sector. But you can see their valuation levels are quite high. So we have this positive leaning towards the local market which has been unlike for some time, of course, and offshore markets have outperformed the local market for, for a number of years. But during the last short while, that has reversed. And it's to some degree the valuation levels that have been achieved internationally and time now for earnings to catch up to, to the valuation levels. So this chart should drift south because it is a, it is a, a price to earnings chart. So as earnings come through, if the prices stay constant, the P chart will come down to what is more normalized levels. But we do think from a global perspective, it's now time for earnings to catch up to the share price levels that we've seen over the last while. Okay, and then this is just uh, the longer term risk that I mentioned, and that's debt to operating profit. And you can see how that's climbing. We can move to the next chart that shows it as well. The debt ultimately doesn't come for free. It's fine while interest rates are very low, but it has to be paid back, of course. Um, let's move to the next chart, please. And that's South African debt to GDP. And you can see how it's gone a little exponential. Uh, the years before when we got to very low levels, that's when Trevor Manuel was around and, and drove it down to a very low debt, uh, debt level. And then the previous administration ran it up. We didn't really see on the back of that any growth coming through the economy. Uh, but nonetheless, uh, more recently it spiked up. And, but there was a necessity to it, of course, because there was COVID and no one could see that or manage that. And one had to spend money into the economy. But the point is um, it's been done and now it has to be addressed. Interest rates at South Africa, as I say, are over 9% for 10-year paper. That's where the government issues, of course, while well, it issues across the curve. Inflation is at 3.5%, three, three so it is expensive in a South African context. A large part of the tax revenue goes to paying off that interest, which otherwise could be used for growth. So one has to just be wary of getting oneself in a debt trap, for example, and so this needs to be addressed. And, of course, you've seen they have started that. In many ways, they have. And you've seen it with the public sector wage negotiations where they've been quite aggressive in trying to contain their their expenses. But this is one of the risks, not only for South Africa, but you can look at the USA and it's a very similar chart as well. Just that in the USA, debt is a lot cheaper, for example. And so whilst inflation behaves itself, the, the USA gets away with it. Okay, and then that's just the, in the US, the the, the the, the rates in the, the Fed rate, and you can see that's as low as it's been as well. So rates in South Africa, obviously, the repos are three and a half. It could be cut if need be, but there's not much left. But it, certainly in the States, there's nothing left. So the world has pretty much run out of interest rate policy, I think. Uh, it would be uh, other programs uh, that we've seen the U.S. pass through, for example, and uh, the the pleasing part, though, is though these cuts in interest rates, the stimulus that's been provided is expected now to, 
bring quite an aggressive pullback in economic activity. So it's unlike that there would have been another need for an interest rate cut. But certainly they're as low as it goes, and it shows how aggressive the stimulus has been around the world. Okay. And then if you just look at the long bond yield, this is something to watch out for. It has been creeping up. As I say, it's gone up to now closer to the 1.5% mark. It is an anticipation of global growth and of inflation. But this does put risk, of course, to equity market because the higher your risk-free rate, the higher your bond yields, more attractive they become. And, of course, they then present an alternative to equities which are highly priced. So one's just got to be watchful of the bond market where it goes because it is a challenge to the equity markets which have run, rallied so hard. Okay, and then this is just unemployment. So you can see in the USA how it's pulled back quite nicely. Uh, it's not really at levels where we think it starts to present an inflation problem under the scenario of growth. But if it gets below that 4% mark again, then all of a sudden you've got high economic growth, full employment, and the inflation pressures start to build up, which is that medium risk that I mentioned. So, you know, I've just tried to cover some of the short term, medium term, and longer term risks and, and one in terms of inflation would have to look at this um, uh, employment levels and, and where they go. And then just of interest for the last slide is you know what really worked internationally. As I said, it's a stay at home count counters under under COVID. They are all based in the USA. So the USA has had a phenomenal return and it's been those stay at home counters like Alphabet, which is Google. Alibaba, Amazon, Microsoft, Tencent, all of those type of counters that facilitated working at home. Or, for example, your cashless society, MasterCard, Visa, companies that were able to benefit out of this type of environment. So that's really just of interest. And um, <clears throat> I think that really brings us to the end of our presentation. I will, I will hand back to Rombo now and just like to take this opportunity to thank all of you for listening in. Paolo, for that presentation and for the investment update. Um, to all our attendees, you'll see that the QR code is now presented for scanning in order to claim your CPD points. Paolo, we've just got three questions um, that we will quickly go through um, that are related to your presentation. The first is regarding the current RAND strength and whether you see the current RAND strength continuing to 2021 year end? Uh, I think uh, it's quite possible that it continues to be relatively strong. Um, as I mentioned, it might go down 14 and a half or thereabout, I think. It's going to have a, 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 a trade on the back of an emerging market play where you find the strength of the global economies play exactly into emerging markets. And emerging market equities, if you look at that, have been quite strong as well. So provided there's stability and not an instability because of a, <clears throat> a COVID event or some other type inflation event, for example, that derails global growth, it's quite possible during the course of this year that the RAND may well trade at stronger levels than where it currently is. And our thought would be towards year end, we're most likely going to be at very similar levels, you know, around the 15 mark or so. But this is really RAND support of this type of environment. Longer term, I would stress, however, we go back to structurally lower growth rates and we go back to very high debt levels, which we have to contain through some form of austerity measures. And that's growth hampering, of course. And we have the, the budget deficit, which we have to attend to and potentially a trade deficit at that point in time as well. So we'll have the twin deficits, potentially they could reoccur. And so I'm talking about two or three years out, and, and that should put some pressure on the RAND uh, in, on a longer term basis. Thank you, Paolo. And then we've got one more question, which is, would, you consider, would we consider lifting our international equity component to the limit of 30%? This, of course, given the, the current rent strength that you've spoken about, but also the fact that international bonds are unattractive um, in our long-term view, um, as, you, as you mentioned in your presentation. 
Yeah, so it could be. Um, <clears throat> the long-term fixed income that we have of about 4% or so is very short durated, so short duration, so it's not long because we expect the uh, weakness in the, or we, we, we would say the bond valuation levels are expensive uh, offshore. Just bear in mind in some parts of the offshore world, you know, Germany, for example, you get negative returns. Uh, in the US, they're still positive, but they're negative from a real perspective. The only concern we have to have is our current valuation levels of um, of developed markets, which are shown over 20 relatively high. So we expect those to remain fairly flat going forward in terms of an e index level, and we expect earnings to catch up. More attractive, we would deem to be our domestic equities, where we think the valuation level is attractive, plus a strong earnings growth coming through. The one thing we just have to bear in mind, of course, is that when we add local and offshore, we can't break the regulation limits where we're fairly close to them at the moment with a pretty much a full weighting to equities. But the answer would be if we saw international markets pull back to some degree, then we may look to top them up from the fixed income side, yes. Thank you, Paolo. That brings us to the end of the webinar this morning. Thank you to everyone who's joined us on the line and have a good morning. Thank you.